I have an article I want to read us. It's called, Is Biden's Israel Policy Cynical or Naive? Now, this is by one of my favorite mainstream journalists who always seems to get people to say dumbass shit to him. But he interviewed Bernie Sanders foreign policy advisor Mike Duss, I think is his name. Or is it Matt? I can't remember. Matt Duss, sorry. To talk about Biden's approach to Israel... I recently spoke by phone with Matt Duss, the executive vice president at the Center for International Policy and the former chief foreign policy advisor to Senator Bernie Sanders. During our conversation, which has been edited for length and clarity, we discussed what's really driving the administration's Israel policy, what a different Democratic administration might be doing instead, and why Democrats in the House and Senate have invited Netanyahu to address Congress on July 24th. How would you describe the Biden administration's policy toward Israel right now? And does it remind you of anything else historically? I bet we could find some parallels, but I also think that this is in some ways really unique. To put it simply, a lot of this comes back to President Biden's own view on how the U.S.-Israeli relationship should work. He's had these ideas for a very long time. He's talked about them a lot. And it basically comes down to the United States supporting Israel and what it wants to do pretty much unconditionally. If there are differences in opinion or criticisms or tensions, those are best expressed in private. Now, I want to explain something to you, chat. I think that Joe Biden may be the worst politician in the history of the United States of America. As far as like his ability as a leader, I think Joe Biden is bottom. I think he's the worst politician ever to ascend to the presidency as far as like raw political talent. He's not very intelligent, so he's a midwit, but he also doesn't have any leadership ability or charisma. He is bottom tier, like the worst. Like you could look at somebody like Herbert Hoover and say he may have not been very good on policy, but he was an intelligent man. Like Herbert Hoover was an intelligent man. He was an engineer. Like he he was a smart guy. You may not think that Donald Trump is very smart, and he's not. He's not very good as a leader. He's not very mature, but at least he has his own kind of animalistic guile and charisma. When you look at Joe Biden, he is not charismatic, not wise, not intelligent, not a leader, no charisma. He's a fucking nothing. He is the worst. Now, it doesn't mean that I agree with Trump more than Biden on policy. I don't. I think Trump's policies are terrible. I think Biden, on a lot of issues, is better than Trump. How much better? Not very much. And why do I say that? Because of the next paragraph we're about to read. As I was reading, I also was reading a little bit ahead. <laughs> and the next paragraph is going to demonstrate that Joe Biden should step down because he's bad at being president in like a not normal way. Occasionally, they will show daylight publicly but there's really going to be no pressure brought to bear or real leverage used of to change any kind of Israeli policy. This is in some ways a reflection of Joe Biden's approach as a politician. He's an old school, let's work it out in the back room and then in public we'll be friends type. But I do think there's a very ideological tit to his approach here. He has repeatedly talked about himself as a Zionist, Talked about his deep emotional attachment to the state of Israel. Even if he's clear that he's not a huge fan of BB personally, he's also made clear that the relationship transcends any two people. What's striking to me about the past few months is that the Israeli government keeps making clear publicly, sometimes at least embarrassingly so, the daylight between it and the United States. It's, it seems to have no effect on the Biden administration's policy or rhetoric. Right now, for instance, we're in a very strange situation. The U.S. is porting forward a ceasefire proposal that it says is Israel's and is claiming that everyone is just waiting on Hamas to agree to it. But it also seems unlikely that Israel actually supports the proposal. I can't really think of any past situation like that. And this is a situation, chat, 
That is unfucking believable. Joe Biden has learned one thing from Trump, which is I will just blatantly lie and my partisans will pretend to believe it. This is shit directly out of 1984. This is shit that is too hackish, even for the worst of the worst. Reality is worse than dystopic fiction. President Biden came out and presented this as an Israeli proposal, which is not entirely false. It's clear that the terms of the deal were approved by the Israeli security cabinet, but Netanyahu almost immediately came out and started casting doubt on that, specifically the part of the deal that would lead to a permanent ceasefire, which has been Hamas's key demand since the very beginning. The far-right members of his coalition came out very soon after saying, unequivocally, no permanent ceasefire here, we oppose this. Members of Netanyahu's own Likud party have said the same thing. And yet the president, the Biden administration continues to say that only Hamas stands in the way of a ceasefire deal. That is plainly false. So Joe Biden cannot be trusted. He blatantly lies to the American people in a transparent and easily provable way. He is not honest. So how can you believe him about any issue? Any issue? He is a complete, he's not a dissembler. He's not somebody who speaks out of both sides of his mouth. He is somebody who says blatant falsehoods that would make Donald Trump blush. He's got to go. Do you view the administration? Uh, do you view what the administration is doing in its public messaging as a political strategy, or do you think that the game here is to convince Netanyahu to go along with this by saying that he already has? The reason this sounds incoherent is because it's incoherent. The White House thought of this as a kind of bold Hail Mary to get a ceasefire by trying to box in Netanyahu via making the deal public. Unfortunately, there was no or else in the president's speech, and that's something that's been missing. They think they're presenting Netanyahu with a tough political choice. Clearly, a majority of Israelis want this deal. The majority of the security establishment wants this deal. They know that this a deal like this is the only way to get back the rest of the hostages. But unless you're going to threaten Netanyahu with something real, he has shown repeatedly over many years that he could just delay and eventually wriggle his way out of the situation. The Biden administration thought they were presenting it with a tough choice. They were mistaken. Because they didn't present any real downside, at least from Netanyahu's perspective, if he essentially says no, or more to the point, if he casts doubts on the terms of the deal, casts doubts on the idea that Israel would commit to a permanent ceasefire, and thus elicits a rejection from the other side. This is a tactic that Netanyahu has used over and over again. And this is also something that Joe Biden has failed to do in domestic policy as well. He failed to create a downside for Joe Manchin in Kirsten Cinema. And as I said at the time, and this is very important, let's go back in time for a second and change to another issue just for a moment, just so you understand why I hate Joe Biden so much. So during the Build Back Better negotiations, the initial negotiation, Bernie Sanders came out with like a $6.3 trillion domestic spending uh, wish list that would have created a kind of square deal, a new new deal, a green new deal, but light. Green new deal light, right? Bernie Sanders agenda, but just smaller, not as good, not as effective, but still a massive expansion of the government's and the social safety net and the quality of life and the material conditions of America. It would have been a reinvestment to take America into the 21st century so that we could legitimately compete with the likes of China on the merits, right? Raise the standard of living in Americans, raise our quality of life. It was without a doubt, a collection of amazing and positive policies. Well, right off the bat, wow, 6.2 trillion. I mean, that's like, that's like 60% of the Pentagon. That's way too much to spend on the people, right? That's way too much. 6.2 over 10 years. So $600 billion plan, right? Basically, you know, spending 60% of what we spent on the Pentagon on the American people, which would be an unbelievable thing to do, right? So the first thing that came out is Biden said, no, 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 that's way too much. So then Bernie came out with a new plan, cutting it down significantly, $3.5 trillion. 3.5 trillion Green New Deal. Now that knocks it down to 30, 350 billion a year, which is still quite a lot of money. 
It's, you know, 40% of what we spent on the Pentagon, but hey, still pretty damn good. A lot of really good stuff in there. A lot of stuff I was excited about. And then um, the centrist Democrats kind of came out and said, ooh, it's spending a little bit much for us. Uh, it's a kind of a big price tag. I don't know if we want to spend that much. They started, they started going, eh, I don't know. And, and of course, because Biden believes in taking forever, they cut it down to like two trillion. Two point a two trillion, right? And they eliminated a bunch of really great policies, but at least there was still a couple of good things in there, still worth doing, right? Would have still been an incredible achievement. And then the centrist Democrats said, well, we're gonna divide it up. We'll have the build back better section, and then we'll have why don't we just take the infrastructure stuff? and put it in its own bill, and we'll have the Build Back Better bill over here, and we'll have the infrastructure stuff over here. And at the time, I said, this means they're going to kill Biden's entire domestic agenda. They're just going to pass all the most right-wing shit, and that's it. And Joe Biden's entire campaign will have been a failure. And that's exactly what they did. And when I said, if they divide it up, that means they're killing his entire agenda. They're killing Build Back Better. And a lot of centrists said, nah, well, you're just, they just want to get some Republican votes on this so they can say this was bipartisan. And then they're going to pass the other thing on party lines. And I said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. They are not going to pass Build Back Better on party lines because you're giving the conservative Democrats everything they want in the bipartisan infrastructure deal and nothing they want is in the Build Back Better bill. So in other words, they just oppose the Build Back Better bill and they like the right wing bill. And all you're going to do is end up giving the most right wing policies possible get passed and all of the stuff that's even center left gets blocked. And that's exactly, exactly what happened that is exactly what happened the so-called bipartisan infrastructure bill was donald trump's bill it was the donald trump bill it was so right-wing and it privatized so much of our infrastructure that mitch mcconnell voted for it and a bunch of republicans that are very far right-wing do you understand this was not an achievement this was a world historical catastrophe bill it made climate change worse and mandated that they had to approve more oil and gas drilling. It was Donald Trump's fucking bipartisan, so-called bipartisan infrastructure bill. It was a Republican infrastructure bill passed out of a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate, and they didn't pass any of Joe Biden's agenda. And here I was the entire time saying, absolutely not. That's going to fucking fail. This bipartisan bill is actually bad on net. It actually hurts the country on net. It would be better if this bill never passed. And everybody who was honest said that at the time. Even Jonathan Chait, who is like a right-wing Democrat who hates the left, he called it a plussed-up highway bill. Plussed-up highway bill. He said, during the ACA fight, I was way, way more optimistic that a bill would pass than nearly anyone else. There were quite a bit of mockery of my delusional optimism, in fact. This time, I'm on the more pessimist again. I'm not so much an outlier as I was in 20, 2009 to 2010. Still think there's a pretty good chance, probably better than even, of passing something. But the odds of a complete failure seem much higher to me than most observers. Not saying that means that right now, just because I was right then. Just struck by the difference. It's not totally clear that, to me that cinema, in particular, cares about any progressive policy goals or the success of the Biden presidency at all. Infrastructure is a plussed up highway bill. It's a nice bill, but if that was the only lasting domestic bill Biden signed, it would be a failed presidency. And that's exactly what it was. A failed presidency.
It's the difference between finishing 0 and 16 and finishing 1 and 15. What would strengthen absolutists is electing Biden and showing the Democratic Party can't advance any progressive goals. Not in health care, not in child care, not in education or the safety net. And that is exactly what happened. So I just wanted to take us back to think about domestic policy. So if you're voting for Biden for domestic policy, you're voting for make-believe magic that didn't happen. If Jonathan Chait said it, and that's exactly what they got, jack and shit. It's a failure of a presidency. Joe Biden is a failure. He's a loser. And he got nothing done that Joe Biden that Donald Trump couldn't have gotten done. He literally passed Donald Trump's immigration policy. He passed Donald Trump's infrastructure policy. This was Donald Trump's second term. It's okay. Let's go back to the uh, foreign policy discussion. It seems as if something similar is going on with the U.S. Saudi Israel deal. On Sunday, the Wall Street Journal reported that the U.S. is pushing to come up with a security partnership with Saudi Arabia and hoping that such an arrangement will advance some sort of Saudi Israeli normalization deal. Buried in the fine print is that such a deal would mean Israel agrees to a Palestinian state, but everyone knows that Netanyahu is not going to do that. I think, as usual, uh, the play here is to offer Israel something so good that they can't possibly say no. How could uh, Netanyahu possibly say no? And the U.S. thinks that there's an internal domestic Israeli political play here. But I'll just say once again, Netanyahu clearly understands his own politics much better than the U.S. does, than the Biden administration does. They'll have no problem stalling on this. The Biden administration's approach clearly seems to be to tee off an offer of the Saudi deal as a huge positive incentive for Israel to make commitments on the Palestinian track. And they're not even asking for serious commitments. And that's what's so laughable about it. I've lost track of what word salad the Biden administration has been using about this lately. A tangible commitment to an eventual path to a conceivable maybe Palestinian say sometime in the future. It's completely qualified and attenuated and totally uninspiring. Because yes, they understand there is no way that this Israeli government or even an alternative Israeli government led by Netanyahu's opposition is really serious about making any of these commitments or taking any of these steps. I would add, this is something that I think needs to be understand more, that there has been an offer on the table, not just from Saudi Arabia, but from the entire Arab League going back to 2002 for full peace and normalization with Israel if Israel follows UN Security Council resolutions follows international law, withdraws from the occupied territory, and enables the creation of a Palestinian state. Joe, if Bernie Sanders would have ended the Palestinian-Israeli conflict had he been elected. Last month, a piece of the Times reported that people in the Biden administration in December thought the war would basically be wrapping up by the end of January. I'm reading this and thinking... Did they believe this or is it spin? Because if it seems as if we're going back and forth with the same thing, where the administration appears very naive, at least publicly, and Netanyahu seems to be running circles around them, do you think that's actually what's happening? Or do you think the people around the president and Biden himself know what's going on? And they feel that either because of their sincere Zionism or because of politics, they are going to keep doing the best they can with a bad hand. I think it's both of the. They're asking Mike, Matt Duss if Joe Biden is a fucking idiot or he's incompetent. Or evil. I think it's both of those things. They're both evil and stupid. The best combo. To back you up, back you up, to back up, you're right. For months now, the administration has not only signaled publicly, it has also briefed privately that they expect the Israeli war to downshift into a different phase. And the war has shifted into different phases, but it has, of course, continued to be enormously destructive and deadly. And this goes back to the problem with the Biden ceasefire proposal. Whatever pressure they think they're bringing to bear on all sides, however they're trying to maneuver with Netanyahu, Biden himself has constrained the United States by refusing to countenance any real pressure. He will not say, we won't continue to supply you with weapons. We will not continue to protect you at the UN. We will not continue to run interference with you with the International Criminal Court. The president's view has been and continues to be essentially that the U.S. will support Israel doing what it feels that it needs to do. That's the bottom line. And that's the bottom line for why I will not vote for Joe Biden, period.
And I urge you to vote against him as well. Maybe the way to ask my last question is, do you think the sense within the administration is that Israeli behavior would actually change if the United States started imposing consequences? Because you could come up with examples through history of people saying, well, there's nothing we can really do to change the course of events, so we're not going to stick by and do the best we can. I think there is and has been genuine debate within the administration about the efficacy of some of these tools for leverage. My own view is that we should find out because even if you're not effective at changing Israeli behavior, the upside is that the United States would no longer be arming a mass atrocity. I think that's a pretty big upside. I also think the serious analysis is that Israel simply could not sustain this war for a long time if the United States withdrew its military support. There's also just a basic sense that, and I will say this as a former staffer myself, once the boss is laid down where he or she will not go, where it approaches he or she is or is not willing to consider, that you try to find solutions within those bounds. And I think that's what we've been seeing here. What can you imagine a different Democratic administration doing? What steps could it take to make a difference? Now, chat, we're going to enjoy ourselves by imagining that Joe Biden lost and he was not the president and that Bernie Sanders through hooker by crook, became the president of the United States on January 20th, 2021. What would have been different? Well, I think a different Democratic administration could have taken this issue more seriously before October 7th. That's not to say we needed another round of the usual peace process, but there have been alarms sounded about Gaza for many, many years by international NGOs, certainly by Palestinians, constantly by Israeli security officials, by members of Congress, including my former boss. The idea that we could just kind of kick the Palestinians into the quarter and manage the problem without any real consequences, that was revealed as a fantasy on October 7th. After October 7th, I hope and think any Democratic administration would have done immediately what President Biden did. Show full support, full solidarity, and really spend time with what occurred on October 7th in all its horror and stand by Israel as it defended its people. At some point, though, and fairly, fairly quickly, it became clear that what was going to be carried out in Gaza was not just self-defense. It became clear very quickly that this was a war of revenge. We have countless statements from Israeli government officials, many of which have been collected in South Africa's case in the International Court of Justice, which accuses, which includes accusations of genocide. And we can see with our own eyes the kind of tactics that are being used on densely populated civilian areas in Gaza. A different democratic administration might have taken it much more seriously and acted with much more urgency much sooner. To do things different regarding PR for Israel at the UN and the International Court of Justice and setting weapons and so on, yes. Not just PR at the UN, but PR in general. I'm sorry, but I watched the National Security Spokesman John Kirby's briefings and it's mind-boggling. I mean, who is he speaking for? It's just these denials of what we could all see with our own eyes. And to continue to claim they haven't really seen evidence that Israel is committing war crimes. It's just such obvious bullshit. So answer your own question. Who is he speaking for? Who does he think his audience is? Is his audience the president? I think he's clear that he's speaking for the president, as he should. And that is what should concern us. Because if this is the messaging that Joe's, Joe Biden continues to want and to require, I was thinking, trying to think about the American-Israeli relationship and what makes it unique. But then I look at our relationship with Saudi Arabia. Even 9-11 didn't cause a large shift in that relationship. I look at our relationship with Pakistan, which after a decade of really bad relations during the war on terror, cultivated with Osama bin Laden being found very close to a Pakistani military base. The relationship eventually changed in certain ways, but broadly stayed the same. And I think there is a real inertial aspect of American foreign policy. How do you see it? I think there is a kind of common security logic between this is a very good question by the way which is like even 9 11 made us didn't make us stop sucking saudi cock so why is that and the answer is quite frankly that the united states of america is the biggest oil producer in the world and they like saudi arabia because they're the same kind of government an authoritarian imperialistic extractive capitalist nihilistic government that is america Saudi Arabia is our values. That is the reality. So the fact that some Saudi citizens killed a bunch of Americans and attacked our capital doesn't change fundamentally who we are.
I think there is a common uh, security logic between the U.S.-Saudi relationship, Pakistan relationship, between U.S.-Israel relationship going back originally to the Cold War, then carrying through into the post-Cold War era of the War on Terror especially. And now we see it in our strategic competition with China, which is the new threat that we must guard against by showing up these relationships with very problematic governments. There's always going to be an excuse to do that. I think we should be very aware of this logic's costs, when we see it, which we see repeatedly. But I also think... An important kind of political and cultural affinity between the U.S. and Israel, which has a real political impact. And in that way, the situation is different. It's not just the arms industry. It's not all the Israel lobby. I grew up in the evangelical church. There was an identification with Israel that was kind of baked into my understanding of history of the region, the history of my own religion. And that's I true, I think, for a lot of Americans, even a lot of Americans who aren't super political, but who don't follow these issues very closely. President Biden has made very clear that it's very much part of his understanding and his identity. And so there's a political and cultural underpinning to the U.S.-Israeli relationship, which I don't think exists or hasn't existed as much with some of the other countries we mentioned. Although I would say that is changing, right? We have more and more people here who have roots in the Middle East and other countries in the region and elsewhere in the world with a very different view of how this relationship should work and the double standard that is often applied. And so that is going to contribute to a different debate as we go forward. God, I hope so. The past eight months makes me think that maybe it's changed less than I thought. Although I guess one response to that would be, no, actually the politics have changed a little bit. Things are changing. The Biden administration has just chosen not to take advantage of the ways in which politics have changed. Well, I think what we've seen it go, but it's not just Schumer. There's a whole other crew of members of Congress who are talking about this issue in a more critical way. And I think that's a reflection of the change in politics. On March 14th, Schumer gave a speech saying that Israel needed to move past Netanyahu. And the Netanyahu era had not been good for Israel. And now Netanyahu is coming to Congress next month. Next month, Your former boss, Bernie Sanders, has already said he's not going to go. It's very hard to understand why Schumer invited him. I think it was, as of now, a very successful troll by House Speaker Mike Johnson, with almost certainly the full cooperation of Netanyahu. And unfortunately, Senator Schubert and Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries have gone along with it. I think it's just absolutely baffling to invite Netanyahu. This is someone who has been accused, credibly, I think, of supporting war crimes. Someone who, even before this war, has a huge history of double talk, racism, of corruption, and somebody who has specifically been enormously uncooperative with a Democratic president. Someone who de clearly desires a Trump restoration. Why give him this enormous gift? So what's the answer to this question? I think it's clear that Schubert and Jeffries decided the path of least political resistance or the thing that would get them the least amount of trouble was simply to go along with this. I disagree with that assessment for both political and ethical reasons. It does seem to be a good representation of Schumer's brand of liberal Zionism right now, where there's a recognition that Israel is not on a good path. There's a recognition that Israel that Netanyahu is a bad actor, but the steps taken to actually do anything about it seem pretty halting and unsuccessful or weak. And that's the definition of the Democratic Party right now. Weak and pathetic. Jason, thank you for the eight months. I think that's right. But we also note that even in Senator Schubert's speech, he made reference, oblique as it may have been, to using pressure to change Israeli policy. We're having a debate right now about conditioning or restricting military aid to Israel, which we simply were not having a few years ago. For the longest time, this was a complete third rail of an issue. No one would continence or talk about the idea that we should actually apply existing law conditioning military aid. And I want to note that these are not new ideas. There are not special consequences that people want to be imposed only on Israel. Our existing U.S. law conditions aids to any country. Even Biden is now in a place where he's accepted the logic of conditioning aid, even if he hasn't used that tool meaningfully yet. After being called the idea outrageous and bizarre in the past, he's now doing it, even if I don't think he's doing it enough. Biden said in his announcement explaining why he wanted the ceasefire deal that Israel had made it impossible for Hamas to launch another October 7th-like attack. This raises the question of whether the United States would continue supporting the war even if the ceasefire deal fell apart. 
If the ceasefire deal does fall apart, do you actually think the United States would stop supporting the war? Unfortunately, I don't. But I thought this was one of the most significant passages in that speech, and I think that was doing something there, and pretty smartly, was to offer Israel and Netanyahu a victory narrative. By saying it, Biden has boxed himself in a little bit, at least rhetorically, because he's now said publicly that one of the major goals of the war has been achieved. There's still reportedly more than 100 hostages in Gaza. Getting their release is a priority. But the best way to do that, as we've seen, is through an, a negotiated agreement. And so now the question is, having acknowledged publicly that Israel has achieved this major goal, how could we continue just supporting it to the hilt with weapons as we have been doing? As you say, looking at the story of the past eight months, I unfortunately don't doubt that Biden will continue to support it. So the TLDR of this article, although we read the whole thing, is this. Joe Biden supports the Israeli genocide and only Joe Biden has take, would have taken us to this point. That it's an insane, Zionist, dipshit move that puts us all at risk.